Peña, and one of my favorite stories of 2023 was about a group of Bay Area adults with disabilities who are making a difference in the robotics industry. This was one of my favorites because we got to highlight this community, which in many cases is forgotten. And we got to prove with this story that regardless of our differences, everyone should be given a chance and it may surprise you. I hope you love it too. At 6 a.m., Tim Zalewski grabs his safety glasses and is ready to build. Well, we're making parts of a unit, and of course, this is the unit, and you gotta like use this, uh, like this wrench. Tim showed us around his new job at Omron, an electronics company in Pleasanton. What do you think about this place? I just think it's kind of awesome. Tim got hired a month ago after excelling as an intern here. Getting that call is still a bit surreal for him. Realizing that I got hired for a full timer. You never thought that was a possibility? Yeah. Why? Well, because uh, because I thought it would be really impossible since Amron is a really busy company. He comes to work knowing that his role is vital to build robots. He is part of a team. Well, it just feels like that I'm starting a new adventure. And what is the adventure bringing you so far? Well, becoming an adult and also working with others. It just sort of feels like I'm making friends. I mean, with adult friends. One of his friends sits right next to him, Joseph Carter. I do LED lights for the top desk. Joseph is an intern now, but he's inspired by Tim's story. Do you like your job? Yes. What do you like about it? Working with people and friends. The one who saw potential both in Tim and Joseph is their mentor, Jesse. I gave him a set of tools. He knew what they were. He knew how to handle it. We just kind of kind of grew on that curiosity. We, we harnessed it. Pleasanton Adult and Career Education, or PACE, for short, is an adult school within the Pleasanton School District that prepares adults with disabilities for the workforce, paying them to intern at different companies. In the last five years, about 56 adults with disabilities have learned key skills to find jobs in this community, and this is one of the 25 sites they work with and we give them three different work experiences. We help them get as many transferable work skills as possible so that they can get a job at the end of the nine month program that matches what they wanna do. For example, Cole right now is learning to take technical orders, but his dream is a bit different. I've become an executive chef and own my own restaurant. His mentor understands him. Feels pretty good, I actually have two stepsons that are both autistic and in their 20s. Turns out Amran is one of the first factories to hire people with disabilities over 50 years ago in Japan. That factory has more than 50% of the workforce are people with disabilities. And now Tim is carrying on that legacy in the U.S. Do you believe this? I can't. <laughs> well, believe it, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Thanks. This is so cool. In Pleasanton, Luz Peña, ABC7 News. Hi, I'm Dustin Dorsey, and my favorite story of 2023 is the Christmas in the Park Sheriff's Work Program because we learned why giving back to the community can be so important during the holiday season. Christmas in the Park holds a special place in the hearts of many, and for those who take part in bringing it to life, the love is on another level. I love bringing my friends and family around and showing them, like, I painted that, I helped build that. You don't understand how, what it takes to, to create this display. A bond built not by choice, but by necessity. A second DUI left San Jose's Catherine Thompson at a crossroads between jail time and community service. The Santa Clara County Sheriff's Work Program brought her here, Santa's San Jose Workshop. The operational warehouse of Christmas in the Park. When I was ordered to my 60 days of community service, the judge mandated three days a week. And he said, I, I firmly believe you need more structure in your life. And the structure that working here gave me actually really did help put my life back into perspective and help me focus on what I wanted to do once I had completed my, my job here. Thompson was just one of the dozens of weekly participants with nonviolent misdemeanors in the program that has been a part of Christmas in the Park for nearly half its existence. The duties include general cleanup of pathways and fences, maintenance and upkeep of displays, and keeping the holiday cheer alive in San Jose. We would not exist without them. They're not just picking up trash. They're doing something that 700,000 people a year will appreciate when they come to Christmas in the park. The program also gives participants an alternative sentence other than jail time and the opportunity for a second chance. That is our main goal and our belief in the individuals that we serve. That ability to self-reflect and know that they're more than what has 
happened in their life. We have to remember that almost everybody who comes into jail is going to get out. And the three things we want them to have is a job, a purpose, and a community. The jail system's all always known for taking. It's good to give back to the community. Thompson completed her time and now has a new job and is getting married. And this Christmas she could walk through the park knowing the impact it left on her life. It makes Christmas in the park so much more special to me than it already was. And it was a big part of my Christmas memories and a big part of my core like San Jose identity. And now it's cemented in that. In San Jose, Dustin Dorsey, ABC 7 News. The story from 2023 that really stands out in my mind is the one that involved the big, thick chunks of mud. Burning Man 2023. This event goes on for a week or so. Final days, torrential rain. They have to close off the entrance, the exit. People are getting stuck in the mud. There's some drama there, but people come together. They get through it. They stay there an extra day or two, and we talk with a lot of those folks, those burners in a parking lot at an In-N-Out Burger in Sparks, Nevada. That's when we first saw all of that mud. Those leaving Burning Man focused on getting this thick mud off of their shoes. It's super heavy. We, it feels like uh, five pounds on each leg, if, if not more. We had to put uh, trash bags on the shoes in order for us to not, you know, uh, sink into so the mud. So it looks like trash bag and then duct tape it, on that. Yeah. So you want to help me get the shoe off? <laughs> Mud that could be seen all over everything Monday, but mud that symbolizes what they went through. Nicole Getz says they were on the opposite side of the camp at Black Rock City when the rain started Friday. We left the bikes there. We didn't even take them back because of the mud. We couldn't get there. We couldn't get to take them back. So we, we, we have no bikes. This was one of those electric bikes stuck in the mud on Saturday morning at Burning Man. This is probably with some of it cleaned off. It's definitely like uh, clay out there, so it's an interesting texture. So tough to walk around, but um, we made the best of it. Those attending the festival referred to as burners with a positive attitude on Monday, along with some of the muddiest shoes that you'll ever see, saying it was about coming together when the weather took a turn. We we're fortunate enough to take care of others and bring them into our camp. We stayed in, in, indoors for about 16 to 18 hours after that. <laughs> we were now like a regular night. There was lots of parties. Every camp had its own parties. We had to wear garbage bags around the boots, yuck it out in the mud, but it was amazing. Festival organizers warned burners not to leave Saturday or Sunday due to the conditions after the rain, telling festival goers to conserve food, water, and gasoline. Get says they did unsuccessfully attempt to leave. We tried to leave two days ago. It, it was impossible. We tried to leave yesterday. We got stuck in the mud. And then today's uh, good people helped us and we are out. Yes, out and in route back to Southern California for this group. Not one person we interviewed said they wouldn't do it all over again, even with the rain and mud, saying it made things that much more special. That includes Nicole, who gave us this video of what their party looked like Saturday night after the rain. After all of that, would you go back? Yes. What impressed me most talking with these burners was their positivity. Some of them didn't know where they were going to eat or sleep after that bad weather hit, but they came together and made sure that everyone was okay. In Sparks, Nevada, J.R. Stone, ABC 7 News. My favorite story of 2023. That's tough, but it is a tie between two. By now, you may have heard about plans to build a new city in Solano County, but it didn't start that way. It was kept a mystery for years since 2018. 55,000 acres acquired, yet no one knew why. Members of Congress were telling us they were concerned about a possible threat to national security. The mysterious group acquired land surrounding Travis Air Force Base, one of the most critical military bases in the western U.S. So. Over the course of many weeks, I went up to Solano County and spent time in the assessor's office tracking each parcel of land, the ownership. It was like putting pieces of a puzzle together. And we were getting mixed messages from county officials, residents, and even the farmers living there that say they were getting sued for not selling their land. This story became a great example of why policy implemented on the local level is critical to ensure transparency across the state and even in Congress in certain cases. And we got the opportunity to sit down with the CEO of California Forever, Jan Schrammack, to discuss why he kept it secret and revealed the reality for the U.S. Air Force. 
very concerned about our national security and our food security. Spy operations. We know nothing about them. Do you wish you would have done anything differently? No. So you don't regret not coming forward with these plans? No, I think this project could only have happened if it was done in a very methodical way where someone could take a very long-term view, and that included uh, raising capital in a way where the company could take a 40-year view on this. Did you see our stories? I did, yeah. You were aware of both congressmen raising alarm that there was a possible threat to national security. Mm -hmm. Did you have any thought to, to call them after you saw those stories? I felt that uh, if, they, if, they, if they wanted the answers, they should have reached out. For months, you know, the better part of a year, people were concerned that it could be tied to a foreign adversary. Do you regret not coming forward and at least calling them to say, hey, this is what's going on? I mean, we've provided information to the federal government. We provided the whole investor list to the federal government a long time ago. The entire investor list? Yes. And when you say a long time ago, when was that? At least six months ago. Six months ago? But these purchases started back in 2018. That was the first time anyone asked us. So, uh, I mean, we've, we've, always, we've always taken the view that um, if there was any concern about these investments, particularly in light of national security, uh, we would hear from um, the appropriate agencies within the government um, and we would provide information. And the moment that we heard from the federal government that there was a concern about this being China, uh, we gave them the information they needed to make sure that it wasn't. You know, the county administrator and the county assessor both told us usually when they work with investment groups or developers, they are involved in the plans. They want to sit down and meet with them to assess the viability of how it would work and what they would be up against. Do you think you should have done that? Uh, we are doing that. We have told them that we would like them to be as involved as they can be in the process. I mean, back in 2018, do you um, think you should have done that? When you started this process, do you think you should have done that back then? I think we would have put them in a very difficult position if we had done that. And so I think what you often see is that someone will come in and they will, they will acquire the properties. And then once, they, once they've acquired the properties or once they've optioned the properties, then they will come forward with the plans. And so I think the process we followed is, is very similar to what other people do. Zoning concerns around Travis Air Force Base mm -hmm. have certainly raised alarm bells for local, state, and federal officials who represent the area. Specifically, Congressman Garamendi, who told us last week he cannot rule out a threat to national security still mm -hmm. at this point in time, given the zoning overlay for Travis. What's your response to that? Um, we told Congressman Garamendi, and, and we've told it to many of the local elected officials as well, we will not change the Travis um, Reserve zoning overlay. And so this is a, this is a zone that protects about, I want to say, 7,000 acres around Travis. Um, and we've been very clear that we are not going to use the initiative to change that. And so anything that we do in the zone around Travis uh, would only be done with the support of the defense community and of the base. So what will that area be used for? It could be used for many things, and one of the, one of the things that we're working on right now is, is, is talking to the defense community about um, how can we make Travis stronger? What can we do that makes the base stronger? Um, and so any of those uses could go in that area. Um, we have offered it to, um, we have also discussed growing olive orchards there. Um, it, could be, it could be many things, but it would only be done if Travis supports it. When did you first reach out to Travis Air Force Base? Um, after we've announced, basically immediately after we've announced the plans publicly. Which was? A month ago, probably. So you, no communication before that? I mean, we've had communications with Travis. Um, uh, we've had communications with Travis going back several years where the base, um, there's tactical things that they need. They need, um, they need easements to monitor um, kind of cleanup activities. They need easements for water. Um, they need kind of practical day-to-day -day property management issues. If the intent was to build a city years ago, why did you purchase land around Travis Air Force Base early on? Um, because we wanted to be able to work with Travis in a way that, um, that protects Travis and that makes Travis stronger. You just said that you wanted to do it, specifically those purchases around the base, because you wanted to work with Travis. How can you work with Travis if you only communicated to them just a month ago for the first time? Because we never proposed to do anything before then. Uh, we, would, we, we knew that we would want to, we would talk to Travis before we ever proposed anything. Um, and so we would purchase the properties and then, then work with them. What do you say to your critics who say Travis Air Force Base deserved an explanation back when you first started acquiring land? Um, if Travis had contacted us and asked for an explanation, we would have absolutely worked with them. Um, and the, 
border defense committee to provide it. What do you say to those people who are still concerned there may be a tie to a foreign adversary with this project? Um, I would say that we've received complete scrutiny from multiple federal agencies um, and uh, they have all of the information they need to make sure that there isn't anyone. Has that investigation concluded? Um, I can't comment on that uh, any further. But you've provided everything? We've provided everything a long time ago. And again, that was first provided six months ago, you said? Yeah. So do you plan to hear from them again? Um, I, um, I, don't, um, I don't expect to hear from them, honestly. I think they have everything they need to, um, to make sure that there, um, um, that there is no foreign involvement. For the I-Team, Stephanie Sierra, ABC7 News. Melendez. I'm sort of called the bag lady and let me explain why. In California we banned single-use plastic bags but the plastic industry tried to get around it by introducing these heavy-duty plastic bags which can be used over and over again. That's why they say they are reusable. Well you know me, I had to put one of these to the test and I had fun doing it. San Francisco was the first city in the nation to get rid of single-use plastic bags in 2007. In 2014, the rest of the state would also ban the so-called urban tumbleweed. Overnight, like at our recycling facility, Pier 96, it's like plastic bags just went away and they were no longer a problem. People began embracing the concept of bring your own reusable bag to the market. The law did allow for stores to offer paper, or heavy-duty plastic bags, but only if they were considered reusable. But then because of the fear of spreading the coronavirus for a short period of time, any bags brought from home were not allowed. So during the pandemic, we stopped bringing our own uh, reusable bags to the store, and that was important to protect public health, both ourselves as shoppers, but also to the workers at the stores. The problem now is that some people are having a hard time giving up those heavy-duty plastic bags. So much so that they don't mind paying extra to use, in some cases, lots of them. Lots of them. Do you have, okay. So why not bring your bag? I'm going to try, I'm gonna try to remember that. So, I, um, so are these, how much did you have to pay for these bags? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. Ten cents right here. Oh, really? I think so. The plastic industry claims these heavy-duty plastic bags can be reused up to 125 times. That's how, by law, they are allowed to be called reusable. They're not necessarily being used as much as the industry claims that they can be. Um, and they are ending up in our landfills. What do you do with those bags after you're done with them? Actually, I've got to stack them at the house. Sometimes I use them just different things. Like... Do you ever throw them away? Yes. Once in a while, you'll find people who say they do use them over and over again. Would you say that you use it 125 times? Uh, yes, I do. So here's how they are allowed despite the ban on plastic bags. Number one, they have to be at least 40% post-consumer material and can be reused 125 times. Not 100, not 150, but 125 times. I have no idea how they came up with that number. Each bag must be able to carry 22 pounds at a distance of 175 feet. 125 times. So for the purpose of this experiment, I'm going to go from point A to point B 125 times. That's it. You can still use it. It's reusable. Oh, it just broke at 125. Oh, I'm the one who is not reusable at the moment. I do think California needs to take a look at that law and make adjustments and 
and do what it was intended to do, which was to do away with all plastic bags, kind of thick and or thin. But there is little incentive to do so coming from supermarkets and pharmacies because they are allowed to keep the proceeds from the sale of each bag. In 2020, San Francisco knew charging 10 cents wasn't enough to keep people from buying them. So the city increased the fee to 25 cents per bag. Does it bother you that it's 25 cents per bag? I have. We're in San Francisco and we're in California. So it just used to it. I just, I don't think about it because it's about convenience. Hi, I'm Karina Nova, and I want to tell you about my favorite story that I got to cover in 2023. And this one has to do with the future. There's actually a company that is developing flying taxis in Fremont. So yes, imagine this. Uh, you need to go somewhere, maybe it's an hour away. Rather than hopping into an Uber or a taxi, you're hopping into one like that, but it's going to go up and it's going to fly in the sky and get you there. The future is here in the Bay Area, specifically in Fremont, where these autonomous aircraft are being built. Supernal is an advanced air mobility company, part of Hyundai Motor Group. The vision is to create an air taxi that would allow people to skip the commute on the roads. Ramona Stefanescu is the lead research manager. Going from a, a hub, like an airport, or a, again, a, a downtown, right, San Francisco or San Jose, to, um, to Palo Alto or some city in between, that can be done uh, as a short trip with an air taxi. Not being stuck in traffic, not spending 40 to uh, 50 minutes in, in traffic. We want to give time to people to spend more time with their families. Stefanescu and her team are in the process of designing a first-generation aircraft. It would seat four people and at first be piloted by a human going about 120 miles per hour with a 25 to 30 mile battery range. What we're looking at here is it does kind of look like a helicopter to me but what's different? So uh, you're going to see a lot of movement in the, in the rotors so you're it, you're you're taking off vertically you're flying as a plane forward and then you land back uh, vertically so it's a it's a mix between a helicopter and a, and a plane how hard is it to design and build something this new um, it, it is challenging uh, but you know we, we cannot forget that we are building on, on top of existing technologies and an existing um, manufacturing process for for aircraft for civilian uh, uh, commercial aircraft and uh, general aviation aircraft part of the process is developing batteries that are lightweight and powerful building the airframe rotors sensors as well as an ecosystem for these vehicles to take off and land something they're calling a vertiport. So it's going to be a dedicated structure. Um, we can draw analogies with a, a, a helipad right now, right? A very similar uh, construction where we need to land vertically. Uh, but yes, it's going to have uh, charging stations. This is an electric aircraft powered by batteries. So it's going to have uh, availability of charging stations for, for cars, for the aircraft, uh, but also to, to park our cars or bikes, or as I said, hopefully we can walk to, to a vertiport. So what does it take to build something this future forward? Naraj Nath, head of facility strategy and management, says a big part of it is attracting Silicon Valley tech talent with the help of an innovative and welcoming work facility. At the highest level, we were given the direction from HMG and our leaders to build, a, build a, an office space that is better than home and, um, and, and, uh, and, and provide all the amenities that you would have at home just better. The sustainability-focused facility includes many spaces that promote collaboration for the 140 employees who come into work, a gym, entertainment room, free lunches, and more. The timetable for Supernal employees here and across the company to get the aircraft into service is 2028. That's five years from now. Through this process where we have safety as, as the core, it may take a few years and we, you know, taking the right steps, uh, we, we may not be the first or second to market, but there is something that the company is dedicated to, the, the safety of, of our aircraft. In some of this video, we're seeing multiple mm -hmm. aircraft flying at the same time. Yes. Will that 
be the future? Yes, that, that's definitely the, the, the future. And uh, we are working on uh, aircraft uh, uh, integration in the airspace. We uh, are aware that we are not going to be the only one flying. Mm -hmm. So fog, rain, will yes. that be an issue? Uh, uh, that's uh, some of the work that my team is, uh, is looking into, how we are going to operate um, when we are going to have fog in San Francisco. In 2038, you imagine your friends, family saying, oh, I'm going to take this to skip my commute in my yes. car. Yes, and I hope myself to, to come to work <laughs> one day with an air taxi. I, I hope that for sure. I, I, we need it here. <laughs> Karina Nova, ABC7 News. I'm Gloria Rodriguez, and the favorite story I worked on in 2023 was for Latin Heritage Month. It's about world-renowned opera singer Arturo Chacon Cruz. I caught up with him when he performed at the San Francisco Opera. He got his start in mariachi music, and it was just so great to highlight a success story in my Latino community and to share his talent with others. I hope you enjoy it as well. He can bring you to tears with his Italian arias. But tenor Arturo Chacon Cruz started his musical journey by singing popular Spanish mariachi songs like these. Mariachi is almost like opera. I say almost because this, the, the, we tell stories in a very, very short period of time. We, we tell a whole story in one song, and sometimes the songs will connect. Mariachi has the life, has the joy, has the incredible expression through the voice and the music behind you. Chacon Cruz has performed in 30 countries at the most prestigious opera houses around the world but San Francisco holds a special place in his heart. They were doing this opera, Il Trovatore, 20 years ago, and I, I said to my wife, then fiance, uh, wouldn't that be awesome if I can sing that here one day? And 20 years to the day, it's happening. So it's, it's a dream maker as well. Chacon Cruz is helping younger artists achieve their dreams, like Moises Salazar, his understudy. I think my favorite thing about him is that he is such a nice guy. And that's kind of, you know, that's one thing you always hope that when you meet your idols, they're nice people. Mr. Placido Domingo gave me lessons and scholarships. I, I studied with the greatest of the greatest, and I, I, I feel like I didn't deserve it at the time. I was so young, haven't, hadn't done anything. So I feel like life has given me an opportunity to give back some of those blessings. He was one of the first tenors um, that I I heard was like a Mexican tenor, you know, and, and being Mexican myself, it's, it was very inspiring, encouraging, singing, seeing a Mexican tenor. Salazar also started his career in mariachi music, then transitioned to opera. Opera puts this uh, illusion sometimes that it's inaccessible to everybody, and so I grew up um, in Southern California in a ghetto and a part of the town, and you just kind of like, it just seems really far away. And so when I realized I could sing it, I was like, oh, I, I can do this. Chacon Cruz says being a Mexican singer in the opera world hasn't been easy. I was um, urged by an early agent to change my name to something Italian so I would be accepted uh, more easily into the, into the opera world, which I, I didn't think it would have been good for my, my soul, so I said no. And uh, I, I, kept, I kept my name and I kept my, my culture and I kept who I am. In San Francisco, Gloria Rodriguez, ABC 7 News. <laughs> Hi everyone, Tim Johns here. So my favorite story for 2023 is actually one that we did in December. Now what it's about is a landfill that was built near a beach in Daly City years ago. I'm talking about in like the 1950s, 60s, 70s, this landfill was in use. It's been built over since then. There's parking lots on top of it, but due to erosion over the past couple of years, it started disintegrating and releasing bits of trash, bits of that landfill, coming down the mountain and going towards the ocean, which obviously has huge environmental impacts, not just for the beach itself, but also for the wildlife. The reason I love this story so much was, obviously it's not a positive thing, but it draws attention to our beautiful environment and the coastline that we really have to protect and something that I'm really passionate about. Watching the sunset over the ocean at Muscle Rock Beach, you'd be forgiven for thinking you found a little piece of heaven. 
But under the surface of all that natural beauty is a persistent and worsening problem. Trash, and a lot of it, making its way down the bluff and towards the beach and water. We can't treat the ocean like a supermarket and a sewer at the same time and expect no problems. The trash issue stems from an old landfill that was in operation in the area from the 1950s to 1970s until it was built over. Over the decades, natural erosion and other factors have slowly chipped away at the terrain, exposing decades of old trash. The really scary thing is that in many of these old landfills, we don't really know what was what went into them. Um, Liz Taylor is the president so of Deep Ocean Exploration and Research in Alameda. She says problems with former landfills are popping up all over the country with devastating impacts on everything from the local environment to marine life. It comes back to us uh, eventually in, in, for people that consume seafood. Um, we're consuming plastic at an alarming rate. San Mateo County Supervisor David Canepa tells us local leaders are well aware of the problem. He believes that due to its massive scale, fixing it once and for all will require outside help. And the only way we're going to solve it is if we double down with federal and state dollars. But even with extra assistance, fixing it won't be easy. You're talking not tens of millions of dollars. You may be talking 150, 200 million dollars. For residents who live nearby, though, they say they just want something to be done. We want to keep the beach clean for everyone. We want to help build our tourism and stuff like that. That's one thing that helps the community out. We live here all of our lives, and we like to show people, like, listen, you come to Pacifica, you're not going to see trash. In Daly City, Tim Johns, ABC 7 News. Hey, I'm Dan Noyes. One of my favorite stories from 2023 was about car break-ins and how San Francisco keeps letting these guys out again and again, even when they commit felonies and injure officers. It's our job to hold public officials accountable, and I take that very seriously. Here is the first look at a crime scene that spanned several blocks in San Francisco's North Beach. It didn't receive much media coverage. After 9.30 on a Tuesday night in April 2022, police spotted a stolen SUV used in multiple car break-ins that day. The police sort of trapped him. This is a one-way street. He, they trapped him down there. Police had the suspect, 24-year-old Robert Sanza, in a dead end on Union Street past Montgomery, but he rammed the SUV into a patrol car and sped away. He took out this garage on Alta Street, sideswiped cars, and returned to the intersection where Officer Riley Bandy had just pulled up, getting out of his patrol car. He just headed right straight for my car and tried to run me over, so I had to jump in back into my car to avoid getting killed. He was aiming for you? Yeah. Your, your body? Oh, yeah, because I jumped back in, and he slammed right into my car. You know, if I had waited a second more, I'd have been dead. So, and then he did it again. I tried to get out of the car. Same thing. He backed up, did it again. Bandy left by ambulance and says he still feels the effects of the back injury he suffered that night. Next, Santa drove onto the sidewalk, hit this staircase, took out a Vespa, made it to Columbus and Broadway where he slammed into a civilian's car, injuring him. Sansa ran from that scene, officers finally catching him a few blocks away in Chinatown. He victimized a lot of people that day. It wasn't just me. At first, prosecutors charged Sanza with several counts of assault upon a peace officer with a deadly weapon, hit and run, evading an officer with willful disregard, leaving the scene of an accident, resisting arrest, and a misdemeanor possession of burglar tools. In a plea deal, all the charges got dismissed, except a single count of evading an officer. So I was really surprised to know that they, that they really dropped, you know, almost everything. <laughs> That court proceeding also included an incident from February 2nd of last year. Police responded to the Japantown garage for a report of an auto burglary. Officers tried to detain Sanza as the suspect, but he fled, got in his car, ran over an officer's foot, and hit a parked car. That case brought nine more charges, including assault upon a peace officer, burglary of a vehicle, hit and run, and resisting arrest. I wanted to find out why all those charges were dropped, except for a single evading, in two incidents that injured officers and a civilian and did all that damage to homes and cars. I certainly don't want to see any officer injured um, while doing their job. District Attorney Brooke Jenkins discussed the case with me, but through their offices, the public defender, Sylvia Wynn, the prosecutor on the case, Farah Zaria, and the judge, Linda Colfax, declined my requests for an interview. 
The hearing transcripts show that the probation department did not agree with their plea deal that would let Robert Sanza avoid prison time by participating in a residential program. Quote, probation instead recommended that he be sentenced to serve his time in prison. Still, Sanza got out with time served, a little over six months in jail. How did that happen? So... Uh, now, was that a good outcome, do you think? So I have looked uh, uh, at that case uh, briefly. I, I was left with concern about that plea. Uh, it is not something that, on its face, I believe I would have done. This case began under former prosecutor Chase Boudin before his recall, but it wrapped up in the early months of Brooke Jenkins' administration. There was a culture that had been established here by the prior administration of very lenient plea offers, um, and it takes time to sort of correct course to have lawyers understand the true value of a case, the true public safety risk that certain people pose. Robert Sanza got arrested again September 1st. He's accused of breaking into a bait car, taking Burberry bags belonging to San Francisco Police Department. On the same day, he's also charged with breaking into two rental cars, including this one with out-of-state plates at this parking lot along the Embarcadero. Linda and Dan Oligas lost cash, a $1,200 iPad, and a $3,500 laptop. Does it mean anything at all that the police were able to catch your guy with their bait car? It worked. I mean, their, their law enforcement technique worked. It does, but then, you know, let's see what happens to this guy. Because, you know, it wasn't his first rodeo. You know it's a professional job. What are they going to do, slap him on the wrist and let him out in a couple months? One other twist in this case, the court asked Officer Bandy to write a victim impact statement that he read for us. I request leniency be granted to Mr. Sanza and that the charges be dropped. I said mercy always triumphs against judgment. Let us end 2022 with mercy and forgiveness and grant Mr. Sanza his freedom. There is no indication from the transcripts that the judge considered Bandy's statement or even read it. Between him and I, there's forgiveness, you know. I had no idea that he would go out and do it immediately again as soon as he got out. Um, that's the Bay Area for you, though. That's, you know, it's, uh, this, these crimes happen so often. I'm Suzanne Fawn, and my favorite story of 2023 was the story that photographer Edward and I produced in Sonoma. It's about the huge role that Chinese workers played in creating California's wine country. Now, most of us know about their role in the Transcontinental Railroad, but this truly was a history lesson for me. I hope you appreciate it. This, this one is great, right there. 85-year-old Paul Giannapa always wanted to make wine. I uh, total acre is about 16 acres. He never expected to make history. He's been 42 years. And uh, the family and the family helped me put all this together. G is the very first Chinese-American vintner in Northern California, a labor of love that stretches three generations. My dad drove a tractor. And while G is part of wine country history, the story of Chinese laborers there is even more historical. This is the and the forgotten in history. Jack Ding, a Chinese-American and former mayor of Sonoma says, Chinese workers played a huge part in building California's wineries. We never see their name. When they are mentioned about wine workers and the laborers, all the Chinese immigrants listed as Zhang Chinaman, Zhang Chinaman, Zhang Chinaman. Even no any of the first name they mentioned, that is a sad. That is a wrong. It's a shameful. But at Buena Vista Winery in Sonoma, which was founded in 1857 and is considered one of the oldest wineries in the Golden State, wine tastes good. Mm -hmm. Visitors immediately learn about the history of Chinese laborers. Their story carefully preserved on the walls inside. We could see the Chinese worker here carrying uh, materials across our creek. The Chinese played a, a major role in working the vineyards. Uh, working in the winery, digging of the caves. And our founder account, Augustin Horosti, uh, was a big proponent of, of those Chinese uh, laborers and workers. We've seen anywhere from 200 to 500 workers. It, it was considered the largest labor camp north of San Francisco. A painting by Jake Lee, now at the Chinese Historical Society of America, captures the role of the workers at Buena Vista Winery in Sonoma. Basically, 
This is a vivid picture represent the piece of the history in the Napa, in the Sonoma. One of the places you can still see direct evidence of the labor of Chinese workers is right here in the caves at Buena Vista Winery. You can actually see the original pickaxe marks from, from the 1860s when these caves were dug and the building was built. Like those who worked on the Transcontinental Railroad, these Chinese workers at many wineries and vineyards faced immense challenges, dangerous and difficult work conditions, and discrimination. A lot of Chinese workers never became U.S. citizens because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which lasted 61 years. Many say the story of the Chinese worker needs to be recognized and remembered. There's an effort underway to honor the Chinese laborers who helped develop California's wine industry during the 1800s. Ding and others are raising money to put up a traditional Chinese pavilion, or Ting, at the Depot Park Museum in Sonoma. To honor these forgotten, nameless, Chinese laborers who made a contribution here 150 years ago. That is extremely important. As for G and his love for grapes, wine make you happy. G grows them and sells his grapes to Bushane Winery right next door. And like a good neighbor, he often checks in. Dr. G is essentially our local celebrity. You know, he comes by all the time. Some say diverse backgrounds add a lot to wine. It needs to happen that there is more diversity within the wine industry. Eric Goodmanson is director of operations for Bouchane Winery. If we want wine to really grow in the United States and abroad, we need to understand that it's not just a privileged white person's beverage. And it's for everyone and it's by everyone. And so understanding the history of it is important. In Wine Country, Suzanne Fawn, ABC 7 News. Hi, I'm Lauren Martinez, and my favorite story of 2023 was the surfboard biting sea otter in Santa Cruz because she managed to make trouble but remain in her natural habitat. Hope you enjoy it. I came over here and everyone's talking about it, and I said, well, I, I was videotaping a cute little otter, and everybody said, hey, that's... That's 841. The surfboard biting sea otter in Santa Cruz has once again evaded capture attempts by wildlife officials. I'm extremely frustrated and exhausted. Colleen Young is one of the divers on the capture team from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They've been working with Monterey Bay Aquarium staff since July 2nd. These are photos taken Wednesday. Officials are responding because this five year old female otter is showing concerning and unusual behavior by approaching people. We don't have it, this issue that frequently to you know know exactly how to um, to capture an animal with with this uh, set of behaviors. So um, you know we're just trying to be as adaptable and creative as we can. This mischievous otter has quite the history. A spokesperson for Monterey Bay Aquarium said the otter's mom was rescued in Santa Cruz in 2016. The mom had reports of approaching people on kayaks and boats, but nothing to the extent of her daughter, otherwise known as Otter 841, which is her rescue number. Although we haven't observed her being aggressive towards people, she's really focused on the boards or if they're wearing fins, she's focused on the fins. Um, you know, we don't want to have a person um, accidentally bit. Officials say when she is captured, she will undergo a health assessment and eventually rehomed in a zoo or aquarium. Local surfer Joseph Wilcox said that's a shame. He held a surfboard Friday that says keep 841 free. Every time humans come across some nature that doesn't act their way or, you know, acts like nature, we got to put it in a cage and, you know, take it somewhere. This is where she belongs. This is her home. This is our home. We can share it. And yeah, watch out for the otters. Wildlife officials say they had crews out on Friday and they'll keep trying until they capture her. Obviously, the ocean is her home. Uh, everyone who's in there is a visitor. But other, unless everyone's willing to stay out of the water, which I think is unlikely, um, yeah, with it, capturing her is the only way we see this issue resolving. In Santa Cruz, Lauren Martinez, ABC 7 News. I'm Lena Howland, and my favorite story of 2023 is about a Danville gymnast we profiled as she was preparing to compete for the Down Syndrome International World Championships, mainly because the whole point of the story is about treating everyone equally, regardless of their abilities. And get this, this gymnast went on to win her third world title just weeks after we aired this story. Hope you enjoy.
Meet 31 year old Chelsea Werner out of Danville. Hey, where are you starting? How about here? From the floor to the vault, the beam and the bars, with a little trial and error, Werner comes to the gym for practice four times a week to perfect her craft. Did you do it? Yeah. <laughs> ah, she did it! We're now at a point where I, it's just no different than coaching any of the other kids. How many years have you been doing gymnastics? Like your whole life? Oh, the whole, whole life. After spending the past six years in USA Gymnastics with individuals without disabilities, next month she's headed to South Africa to compete in the Down Syndrome International World Championships. It just seemed like a great experience. Her gymnastics has never been better than it is now. So um, the competition will be tough, but Chelsea's ready. Chelsea is no stranger to the international stage. She won first place in the same competition first in London and then in Italy six years ago. I won in Italy. You won that in Italy? Was that your first world championship? Yeah. But Chelsea was way better than anybody else that was at that competition. They didn't have the skills that she was doing even listed. There you go. That's her coach, Don Pombo. She's been working with Chelsea for around two decades now. But when they started, she had no experience of working with kids with special needs. It was a learning curve for both of us. What's your secret? I treat her like, like she doesn't have, I mean, like anybody, she doesn't have Down syndrome, right? She just comes in the gym. You have to do a handstand, you have to do a handstand. And that hard work has paid off tenfold, inspiring parents of kids with Down syndrome across the world. You just think there's not going to be opportunities, you know, for my, my little child with Down syndrome. And Chelsea and other athletes are proving that that's completely untrue, that the sky's the limit. As for South Africa, are you ready for September? Are you ready to compete? Yes. If she does what we practice, she will win. In Dublin, Lena Howland, ABC 7 News.